everyone. Um, so this is going to be our first and probably only online lesson and I just want to introduce you to this idea. So what we're going to be doing is basically going through um, the packet for today like we normally would, but of course with me talking a whole lot more than I usually do um, and you listening hopefully a whole lot more than you usually do. Um, and I do want to introduce uh, our lesson for today. So first of all, the main thing that we're going to be working on is sort of a, think of it like a year-long review of everything we've learned about argumentation up to this point to prepare you for, of course, our mega debate that's happening uh, in two weeks on our last day of class on um, May 26th, I believe, that last Thursday that we have. Um, so I do want to start off by talking about um, some of the rules, these are not all of them, but these are, uh, I would consider some of the most important for debate, the rules of argumentation that we've went over so far. So let's start with um, a few that you remember. Um, probably the first 10 are pretty solid in your mind, and then 11 through 23 might be a little bit more sketchy. Um, so I do want to review these and hopefully solidify them in your mind. Um, so first of all, we have Number one, distinguish premise and conclusion. So if you remember from our discussions, the premise is essentially um, your evidence, if you want to think of it like that, it's your reasons why the conclusion is true. And then think of your conclusion like a thesis statement. So you cannot have faulty premises and expect to have a correct conclusion. In addition, you cannot have a faulty conclusion and expect your premises to prove it. So you have to have solid premises and then a solid conclusion that is based off of the premises, based off of facts. If you don't have that, then frankly, you don't have an argument. Number two, present your ideas in a natural order. Essentially what this means is that um, you need to be able to present your ideas in whatever order makes sense for the argument. For example, if it makes sense for you to go in chronological order, for example, Pichero, since you're talking about um, Iran and the nuclear deal that is going on right now there, <clears throat> what you may do is present it in chronological order. So for the benefit of the audience who may not be familiar with everything that has happened throughout the history of this deal, you may need to go through and explain kind of what has been going on. Others, uh, another idea for ordering your topic would be perhaps to do it in um, order of importance. So you start with your least important point and then you escalate into your strongest point, which hopefully um, will get your, your listeners' attention and and help them to remember the strongest point because of course people tend to remember the last thing that they heard then you number three you want to start from reliable premises so this is what's called inductive reasoning inductive reasoning you start with a premise and then you work your way into conclusion if you remember I'll I'll uh, be doing a little bit of poor drawing over here like I normally do so inductive reasoning is essentially where you have um, your premises and then your premises lead you to a conclusion. Now, you might think this is backward because, of course, in debate, you are given a conclusion, first of all, and then you have to think up reasons for it. However, this can be used in debate also. The way that you use this is you know what the final conclusion that you're going to is, but you don't know basically the reasons that you're going to use to argue. Use the premises to determine the reasons. So, for example, Let's say you're arguing that um, there should not be any more homework, that it should just be classwork. If that's your conclusion, then you need to find premises that support a reason that supports your conclusion. So if you find a premise that supports the idea that homework causes much more stress um, than any other for than any, any other kind of activity, then what you can do is use that premise along with, of course, others to support that reason, and that reason supports your conclusion. So essentially, that's what I'm talking about about here, starting with the facts and using them to build your case. All right, next we have number four, use definite, specific, and concrete language. So essentially what I mean here is that if you are going to be arguing um, something that's a little bit more complex, especially, uh, for example, Safia, you're arguing that um, Harvard should continue to accept Asian students, even though there are more Asian students than any other type of students, um, then what you're probably going to need to do is make sure that your language is consistent throughout 
your whole speech, your whole debate, and also make sure that it's very specific. So when you're talking about Asian students, are you talking about um, Chinese students? Are you talking about all Asian students? Um, who does that include? Because if you say that it only includes, for example, um, you know, Chinese students, then you are limiting your topic and the person who's arguing against you might be able to easily uh, cut down your argument and say, well, that's just a small percentage of students. So you want to be careful um, that you're using the uh, correct and most specific language that you can. Number five, you want to play fair. In other words, don't use loaded language or define terms inappropriately. So when you are talking about Asian students and you are uh, maybe lumping them all together as being um, you know, all smarter than <laughs> other students, as, as Harvard seems to do sometimes, um, you want to play fair. So Crystal, you're the one arguing against Sathya in this debate. So what you would do <clears throat> is you would make sure that you're not using too loaded language. So when you're talking about the fact that Harvard should not admit um, every qualified Asian student, you don't want to lump all Asian students together um, in kind of a stereotypical fashion. Um, so make sure that you stick with that concrete definition, that specific language, um, and that you play fair throughout it, throughout the debate. You also want to use consistent terms. So if you're talking about Asians from all parts of Asia in one part of your speech, don't then suddenly switch to only be talking about um, Indians or something in another part of your speech. You want to use consistent terms throughout so that your audience and um, the judges and of course your opponents don't get confused. In addition, this is definitely something that I've pointed out in debates before and this is something that I think some, uh, some students particularly struggle with. Make sure that you have clear pronoun reference. So, for example, um, if you said, if you're talking about um, America's role in uh, the Iran nuclear deal, you don't want to say, oh, you know, they believe that, and then not say who you believe they is. So they, is they referring to the Iranians? Is it referring to the military? Is it referring to Americans? Is it referring to, you know, who, whoever it might be? Um, also, be careful about saying we. So we, uh, if you're talking about the United States especially, we is assuming that everyone in the United States believes the same way, which of course they don't. It's also assuming that it's kind of an us versus them argument. So, um, P. Sure, when you're talking about how we believe, blah, 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 um, you want to be careful that you're clear about who we is. Or better than that, just don't use we at all. Say something specific like Americans who support the Iran nuclear deal. Okay, there you go. There, there, that defines the we there if you want to think of it like that. Um, also, the they, be careful of that too. So anytime you're using pronouns, you want to make sure that it's very clear who or what the pronoun is referring to. Then, of course, number seven, stick to one meaning for each term. Um, this is very similar to, to the last one. You want to make sure that if you defined it one way, that you don't define it a different way throughout the, the speech or the debate. Okay, number eight, very, very important. This is one of my, uh, one of the things I've tried my best to instill in each of you is that you need to make sure that there is more than one example. This is so important, guys. Um, yes, anyone, pretty much anyone can find one example to support their point. For example, um, there was a story out of uh, Florida, I believe it was a news story, of a man who was going hiking, um, and while he was hiking, he decided that it would be fun to go and try to, I think he was trying to ride an alligator. It was a very strange story. Um, now, if you use that one example to prove that <clears throat> alligators are, are very dangerous and alligators are, you know, should all be put down, obviously you can't do ba base that entire argument off of one person's um, stupidity, I guess, for lack of a better word. So you need to make sure that you have more than one example. 
And number eight, you have to make sure that the, I'm sorry, number nine, you have to make sure that those examples are representative. So that one guy in Florida who probably did something really dumb uh, is not representative, hopefully, of the rest of the population. And that one alligator who reacted to the man who was being very silly um, is definitely not representative of every alligator out there, I'm assuming. So you want to make sure that uh, you, you follow these rules for the examples as well. Also, make sure your background information is, is, uh, is mentioned if it's relevant. So, for example, if you have a statistic that shows that, um, you know, five, of, uh, five out of seven Americans believe that the Iran nuclear deal um, is a mistake, you want to make sure that those... Uh, that if the background information states that that was only a poll of um, Iranian American uh, people, then you want to make sure that you mention that. Also, if it was maybe just Republicans or just Democrats or just, you know, whoever it might be, always include background information. Now, background information actually can help you as well. So if it's an extensive study, let's say they polled, you know, 50,000 people in a study, that is something that you can definitely include. And that adds credibility to your argument more than almost anything else. So background information will not weaken your argument, it will just strengthen it and make it um, when you actually do present the facts of your argument, it's going to make it hit home even harder. Also, don't ignore counterexamples. So as you're doing research, chances are you're going to find stuff that proves the other side's point. Do not ignore those things. Use them to your advantage. So when you see, for example, that someone has a, a fact um, from an, uh, maybe there's another country who also had a similar deal. I'm just picking on Pichra's topic here because it's on my mind. Um, but for example, if someone is using uh, an example of another country in which a similar deal happened and it ended up backfiring on them, don't ignore that example. In fact, you can use the principle of, everyone say it all together, concession in order to use that um, as something uh, that can strengthen your argument. So what you do is you present, or, or maybe you don't present the counterexample, but if the other team presents the counterexample, you can say, absolutely, in that country's case, it absolutely did not work for the following reasons. And then you can list two or three reasons how that country is different than Iran, or you know, if you're arguing the opposite, how that country is the same as Iran, and therefore it would be a similar outcome. So that's where the counterexamples can actually work in your favor. Don't be afraid of them. Um, embrace them. Number 12, analogy requires a relevantly similar example. You know how much I love analogies, guys. I think they're really, really effective ways to argue. Now, analogies can be a little bit, um, I guess, they don't have to be um, the same thing exactly. Uh, if you have, if you're comparing two things, they don't have to be exactly the same. Like, uh, if you remember when we were talking about analogies, we compared how is life like a boat? You know, how is life like a boat? Obviously, there, there's very, there's a very large number of things that make boats and lives and lives different. Um, but we tried to make an analogy in order to compare them. But they need to be relatively similar examples um, if you're going to use analogies. So, for example, um, if we're talking about um, Harvard accepting Asian students, we're probably going to uh, want to use colleges that are sort of in the same league as that. Like if, we, if you talked about Yale or Stanford or Princeton or something like that, that would absolutely be a good analogy to make. If you talked about a community college, it might be a little bit too far off. Um, for example, Crystal, when you're arguing that um, Harvard should not continue to uh, or should not accept every Asian student who qualifies to be in there, um, you wouldn't want to use, for example, um, a college that's much, much lower in, in status than Harvard. It would just be a false analogy um, and it would cause Safia to have the upper hand on you there. Number 13, sources should be cited. And again, don't be afraid of citations. If you got your sources from uh, from good uh, places, if you got them from reliable, credible sources, you don't need to be afraid to cite them. Now, you don't have to spend a really long time in your speech saying exactly where you got it. You don't have to give the website or anything like that. Um, but just f briefly, briefly state where you got your sources from, and I promise it's going to strengthen your argument because it's going to make it seem more credible. And also, if, if I said, for example, 
that um, you know that that statistic that I made up about five out of seven Americans believe that the Iran nuclear deal is a mistake. Okay, if I said that, you could be thinking to yourself, okay, where did she get that uh, that statistic? Who knows? I mean, it could have been just someone calling their friends, and five out of the seven of the friends um, said that. So if I said, according to um, you know, the Wall Street Journal, or according to the New York Times, who conducted a study of 10,000 Americans, five out of seven of them, etc. So if you did something like that, it adds a lot of credibility. Number 14 are the sources informed. You guys know my favorite source ever, Joe Schmo. So Joe Schmo and his blog are not credible sources unless Joe Schmo is an expert on uh, your topic, but chances are um, he's not. So you want to make sure that your sources are informed <clears throat> and in addition that they are impartial. So you can find any information you want or any information you could possibly ever need um, as long as you find sources that are partial to you. So if you are reading um, an article written by the Harvard Review and it's about, it, it's defending their position on accepting Asians into their school, obviously that's going to be a partial source. And when you cite that source, people are going to immediately dismiss that fact as something that is biased and not fair. So you wanna make sure that um, your sources are definitely as impartial as possible. Or if they are partial, uh, then you wanna make sure that you actually do own up to that fact. In addition, this is not mentioned here, but something that you can do that's a strong, um, that's a strong argumentative technique, is actually, believe it or not, to use sources on the other side, so partial to your opponent's side. So let's say, for example, you're arguing gun control. Now, if you are arguing um, for gun control, you're saying that guns should be restricted, um, and you use a quote or a statistic from the NRA, the National Rifle Association, um, then you're going to seem much, much stronger in your argument than if your opponent who's arguing for guns uses that NRA quote, because of course the NRA is very biased um, against gun control. So you can definitely kind of flip the argument on its head by using a source that's partial to the other side. It makes the other team really, really question whether or not they have the right answer. You also need to cross-check sources. Again, if you find a statistic that's wildly different from all the other statistics that you found so far, you want to make sure that you probably, uh, it's, it's definitely not an, an anomaly or something like that. You want to make sure that you cross-check your sources uh, to ensure that they're actually um, credible uh, and not just kind of a fluke. Number 17, personal attacks do not disqualify a source. So, for example, um, in the election that's currently um, underway, there's a lot of personal attacking going on of different candidates. Uh, now, uh, the other day, actually, it was interesting. I had um, a group of uh, third and fourth graders who sadly were arguing about the election, even though um, they should be, you know, dealing with less, much less serious issues, but that's okay. So these third and fourth graders were arguing about which candidate their parents liked. And at one point in the argument, kind of the point where I stepped in, one of the kids uh, made a decent point about one of the candidates who was going to raise taxes significantly. And the other kid, rather than making a coherent argument, just called the person stupid. Now, of course, that was not something that I condoned as a teacher. And in addition, it's not something I condoned as someone who teaches debate, because of course, Attacking someone personally and calling them names or even just kind of insinuating their inte intellectual um, level, <clears throat> that does not disqualify um, the source. So, for example, that, per that kid who made the point about raising taxes, maybe they actually did have a good point. But the other kid who called that person a name, that definitely did not disqualify um, <clears throat> that information. In a sense, it, it just kind of made them look bad and it made the other person feel bad about themselves. So you want to make sure that you don't personally attack someone, not only because it's rude and not acceptable, but also because it doesn't even disqualify the source. Um, so you want to make sure that uh, you don't do this because it, it's not effective in any way. Number 18, we're almost done here, guys. Does the argument explain how cause leads to effect? Now, the next um, six of these have to do with cause and effect. Now, 
Um, I, I almost asked a question, but I realized you guys can't answer. If you want to answer, you can. Does the cause of a problem, uh, or, or actually, let me reword this question. Um, is there usually one cause to every problem? And of course, the answer is absolutely not. There are multiple causes to each problem, even the simplest problem. For example, if you are late to school, generally speaking, there's more than one uh, cause that led to the effect of you being late. Perhaps, you know, your alarm didn't get off. And then when you got up to use the shower, your sister was already in there. There could be a lot of different reasons for something. And so if there's more than one reason for something as simple as, you know, being late to class, there would obviously be much more than one cause to, for example, the nuclear um, deal in Iran. So you want to make sure that um, you have uh, correctly uh, identified multiple causes and how they lead to the effect. And then does the conclusion propose the most likely cause? Uh, cause excuse me. <clears throat> so if you have a conclusion um, that is not supported by the cause, then that's not correct. So, for example, you want to make sure that you um, double check to make sure it, it's a logical uh, progression. So, if you're talking about what made you late for class in the morning, um, and you mention something about having to feed your dog, well, maybe that was part of the that was part of the reason you were late, but that's not the whole reason, and it might also not even be the main reason why. So, for example, um, Tathia and Crystal, when you're arguing about um, Harvard and their uh, rule about admitting Asian students, there's probably not just one reason for it. So, Crystal or or Safia, rather, if you argue that it's because Harvard is racist and that's it well I mean could that be part of it absolutely but is that the main reason probably not so you want to make sure that your cause actually does um, propose or, or that your conclusion actually does propose a most likely cause for what you're talking about okay um, interestingly enough correlated events are not necessarily related so if you have two things that happened at the same time or that relate to each other, they might not actually be related. It's kind of a, a paradox to say correlated, having the word relate in it, are not necessarily related here. Um, so for example, if um, Harvard chose not to accept all the Asian students who were um, admissible into the college, and at the same time, um, Yale denied an African-American student entry, those two events might be completely unrelated. So you can't necessarily correlate those events, although they might seem like they're along the same lines. Um, also, cor cor uh, correlated events may have a common cause. Um, we didn't talk too much about this, but essentially what this means is that you need to find, again, the cause for these events um, to make sure that um, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, to make sure that uh, they are, if they are the same, that you find out what cause um, led to both of them. So in uh, Pichero's case, when you're arguing about um, the nuclear deal in Iran, what you want to look at are other countries that perhaps something similar has happened in, and then try to identify if there is a common cause between them. So <clears throat> if you're arguing about um, the efficacy of revolting against the government, which we did that debate last year, if you remember. Um, one of the arguments that was made, and I thought it was very effective, was talking about the Egyptian revolt and the French Revolution. And this person, actually I think it might have been Luke who, who argued this. So Luke, you argued that the revolt that happened in Egypt not too long ago was very similar to what happened in the French Revolution. And you were arguing that um, because the causes were similar in those two cases, um, that those events could be compared logically. Number 22, either of two correlated co events may cause the other. And again, that's very similar to what the last one is. And then the last one, of course, we already talked about. Causes may be complex. You need to make sure that you understand the causes of both events. So, all of you who are arguing, so there are, uh, you know, four debates that we're doing. Um, so each each person who is arguing a point, so that includes, um, you know, Crystal's debate, Sathya's, Pichero's, and Luke's, you want to make sure that you understand um, that 
what the causes of your point are. So Luke, for example, you're arguing about violent video games. You want to make sure that you understand the cause of why people believe that they can be negative. Really dig deep into them and try to figure it out. And you also want to look at the other side. Why do people think that they are do not have negative repercussions, maybe? All right, um, so if you have any questions about those, we can either discuss it next week, or if you're in class right now, you can ask Ms. Pantea. Um, otherwise, we'll go ahead and move on to the next section. So let's go ahead and um, start on today's lesson. Okay. All right, um, <clears throat> so as a quick review for what we are going to be doing on May 26th, the final four debates, um, we talked about this last week. Crystal, you were the only one who wasn't here, um, and I talked to you just briefly about it, but I, I do want to give you a chance to read through this um, and make sure that you understand. So I'm expecting very, very good solid, strong debates, guys. We've been working all year on debate techniques um, and argumentation. I really want you to blow me away with how good you have become at arguing, essentially. So because of that, I want you to make sure that you're um, cognizant, you're aware of the fact that you have two minutes, only two minutes for each main argument. A two-minute speech is about three quarters, one half, I would say about one half to three quarters of a typed piece of paper. So keep that in mind. If that's true, then if you have three points, you should have around two and a half pages written down pretty much. Um, you want to make sure that you have uh, a good amount for each subject. And if you don't get to share every single one of your facts, don't worry, because it probably will come up in the counter argument. In addition, you have only 30 seconds for each counter argument and rebuttal. What this does is this forces you to really be concise and precise with each of your arguments. You want to make sure um, that you actually know what the question is that you're asking and you're not just kind of talking for the sake of talking. So what this precludes is that you must have good listening abilities. If you don't have good listening abilities, it's going to be very hard for you to condense your question into 30 seconds or your counter argument and rebuttal into 30 seconds. Um, okay, so each debate's only going to be 15 minutes long. It's going to go by really fast. So make sure that you have a solid idea of everything that you're going to be arguing, pretty much. Um, I talked about this last week, but you need to have at least three arguments for your side, along with a pre-prepared counter arguments with actual facts to back up your opinions. So it's not enough just to think about what counter arguments you're going to have. You also need to make sure um, that you actually have facts and evidence to back it up. Okay, all right, then we have, um, let's see, okay, <clears throat> so you need to have uh, the ARE format, remember that's assertion, reasoning, and evidence, so you're starting off your, spe your speech with an introduction, and then you're giving your main assertion, so what the main point is that you're arguing, and then for each main point, you have a reason behind it. And then for each reason, you have at least one, if not more, evidences to back it up. Make sure that uh, you have a short intro and conclusion prepared before the debate begins. Do not write your conclusion after the debate has already started, which I've definitely seen uh, certain people do, and I won't name names, but you want to make sure that before the debate begins that you actually have a conclusion done. It doesn't have to be long. Um, one or two sentences is completely sufficient, but you do need to have something. You will be docked points if you end this speech with, um, yeah. So that's not a good way to end a speech. So make sure that you actually have one prepared. In addition, you should practice the argumentative techniques that we've learned in this class. The ones that we just talked about on the last slide here, um, you want to make sure that you are familiar with those, that you have a good, solid um, grasp on those. So make sure you have good sources, that you use ethos, pathos, and logos, emphasis on the logos, um, that you use the principle of concession, that you have strong reasoning and, and analysis, etc. And then seven, um, as I think Pichra pointed out last week, is not actually a rule, it's more like uh, just a, a wish of good luck to you. So topic one, this is the one you chose. Everyone has chose one except for Crystal. So Crystal, you will need to choose a debate topic 
anything you want as long as it is um, fairly balanced. So you can't pick something that favors you completely. Um, you want to pick something that has two sides to it. And your opponent is going to be Pichiro. So once you figure out what that is, um, we'll talk about it, and then um, you can let Pichiro know and he can start working on the debate. In the meantime, Crystal, sorry, I'll spend just a little bit of time talking to you. As I mentioned sort of before, if you caught on, your topic um, is going to be uh, your topper chosen by uh, chosen by Sophia is going to be that Harvard should restrict the number of Asian students accepted to their school. Um, currently, there are more Asian students as far as a percentage goes. There's more Asian students who are qualified to be accepted to Harvard than any other um, race. And so what Harvard has done occasionally, not, not as a general rule, but sometimes, what Harvard has done is restricted the number of Asian students selected to, uh, or I'm sorry, accepted so that they can accept other races as well. So they, they can accept, you know, um, uh, d different people besides uh, strictly Asian students. So you're arguing that they should continue to restrict the number of Asian students accepted. So um, you're going to have an assertion, which is essentially this, and then your three reasons, and then your evidence for those reasons, and then have counter arguments plus a conclusion. All right, so uh, Crystal, if you want, you can choose from any of these. There's a whole bunch of topics. I believe I have over a hundred here um, that you want to choose from. Currently, we have three. Um, one of them is, of course, the one you're doing, Crystal, which is about how Harvard should uh, restrict the number of Asian students. Uh, the other one is Luke's topic that he chose, which is about um, uh, should violent video games be... Uh, or should teenagers play violent video games? And then um, the third one, which Pichero, sh which Pichero chose, is about the um, nuclear deal in Iran. So here are the different topics. I guess there's 102 of them. So you can choose any of these that you want to, or you can come up with one on your own. That's completely fine. Um, just let me know what you choose, and I'll pass it on to Pichero, and then we can go from there. All right, guys, let's go ahead and talk a little bit about um, persuasive writing. So for this debate, you're going to actually be writing quite a bit. Um, yes, you're going to be speaking from the outline like you normally do, but I do want you to have <clears throat> um, have this written down at least in a certain extent. Uh, it doesn't have to be perfect, but I would like it uh, written down uh, in the form that you would normally speak in. So I want to talk a little bit about um uh, let's see. Okay, so starting down here. So the following criteria are essential to produce an effective argument. So number one, you need to be well informed about your topic. We talked about that before. If you don't know your topic, how are we going to know um, basically what you're saying here? So you want to read thoroughly about it. You want to use legitimate sources and take notes. So everything that you do, um, you want to make sure that you know your topic forward and backward so that if your opponent throws you a curveball, an argument that you hadn't expected them to include, you're able to bounce back from it very quickly because you know your topic so well that you can pull an example from your arsenal and be able to argue against your opponent um, very effectively. Also, test your thesis. Make sure that there are two sides to it. You have to make sure that it's debatable. So normally, obviously, we choose topics which are automatically debatable. Um, so you don't have to worry too much about that. But do make sure that um, you don't use loaded language when you're talking about your topic because it's very hard to argue against loaded language. It's hard to argue against loaded language, and at the same time, it weakens your argument. So it doesn't it doesn't really help you in the long run. Uh, number three, dis disprove the opposing argument. Obviously, that's the goal is to try to be uh, the winner. And of course, we've talked about this before. But the goal is not just to be a winner. The goal is to find the truth. So if you can go away having won a debate, that's awesome. But if you can go away having won the debate and having come closer to the actual truth behind the topic you chose, that's even better. Obviously, that would be the goal in that case. Um, so you want to understand the opposite viewpoint of your position and then counter it by providing contrasting evidence or by finding mistakes and inconsistencies in the logic of the opposing argument. Remember, your argument doesn't just have to be one example versus another example versus another example and back and forth like that. No, you can actually find inconsistencies in the logic of their argument and point those out. 
So if they are saying one cause led to this effect and you don't think that that cause actually led to this effect, you can call them out on it. And that's completely um, uh, valid as well. And of course, you want to support your position with evidence. Remember that your evidence must appeal to reason. Okay, <clears throat> so let's talk real quick about um, the body of your um, essay or your speech, basically. So this is the heart of it. These, were, these are where your reasons come in. So the writer will provide evidence to support the opinion offered in the thesis statement in the introduction. So the body consists of three paragraphs, basically, um, or three points. Each paragraph is based on a solid reason to back your thesis statement. Since almost all issues have sound arguments on both sides of the question, a good persuasive writer tries to anticipate opposing viewpoints and provide counter arguments along with main points of the essay. So one of the three paragraphs should be used to discuss opposing viewpoints and your counter arguments. So I'll go ahead and amend this a little bit and say one of the four paragraphs should be used to discuss opposing viewpoints. So in debate, it's slightly different um, because in debate, of course, you are thinking up counter arguments as the other person is speaking. And if the other person doesn't bring up one of your counter arguments, one of the points that you were going to argue against, awesome, then you don't need that. Maybe you can use the your notes from it to try to disprove another one of their points. But if they don't use one of the counter arguments um, that you uh, were prepared for, then that's completely fine. You don't have to give that. Whereas in an essay, you would give it regardless. So essentially, this is a practice in um, empathy. Remember, empathy and sympathy are two different words. Empathy literally comes from E plus pathos, and it literally means to feel outside yourself. So empathy, you feel when you are not necessarily on the same page as the other person, but you're able to feel outside yourself and feel from where, uh, feel where they come from. Uh, it's different than sympathy, which is you feel the same, you feel with them, literally, you feel the same as they do, and you're able to kind of, um, you're able to, uh, to, to, to know exactly where they're coming from. So if you don't know where they're coming from, if you don't know what side they're on and why they believe it, you need to practice empathy and really sense, okay, if I believed this, why would I believe this? Where would I be coming from? What experiences might have led me to this place? And what facts would I have in mind um, to uh, prove to prove my point if I were this person? So that's what you that's your goal. That's what you want to try to do. So there are many ways to support your argument. These are just four of them. So you can use facts. Facts obviously are very strong. You can't argue against facts. You can argue the validity of facts, although that even is a little bit tough too, but you cannot argue against facts themselves. If a fact is a fact, then it's a fact and you can't argue against it. Um, <clears throat> also, uh, do not confuse facts with truths. A truth is an idea believed by many people, but it cannot be proven. So, in America, for example, <clears throat> we believe that um, a family should be allowed to have uh, as many children as they want to. And that's fine. That's their right. That's their prerogative. That is our truth. But that is not a fact that families um, should be able to have as many children as they want to. If you look at um, China, for example, up until the beginning of this year, there was a one, one child per family policy. And that was their truth, in a sense. And so you want to make sure that you're not confusing facts with truths. Then we have statistics. Um, you know, you guys know how much I love statistics as long as they are presented well. And last week we talked about storytelling. We talked about the um, ability to tell a story and how effective that is when you're presenting statistics. So in statistics, you want to tell it like it's a story. So build it up into something that is interesting to listen to. Don't just drop the statistic in our lap with no evidence uh, or with nothing surrounding it. Nothing after to analyze it, nothing before to set it up. You can't just drop a statistic and expect that your opponent or the judge is going to actually remember what you said in that statistic. Quotes are great as long as, of course, um, they are uh, actually effective. 
So <clears throat> Luke and Crystal, I think a couple weeks ago, you guys both had a, had great examples of quotes um, in your debates, and I thought they were used very, very well. So uh, my general rule of thumb, uh, and I teach this to my writing students as well as to debate class, is of course, if you have to go looking for a quote to help you support your argument, it's probably not a good quote because you're going to find things that maybe are tangentially related to the topic or they're very generic, um, but you're probably not going to find the perfect quote to present your argument. But if you find a quote as you are doing research that you think is just perfect, use that in your argument. That will probably help you. So again, use a quote sparingly and only if it is really something which you could not have said better yourself. If you can say it in this basically the same words or if you can just reword it and say it yourself, then do that. But if someone said something in such a way that uh, it really, really uh, kind of hit home, you can absolutely use it. Alternatively, if it was, if it, uh, excuse me, if it was said by a person who is a credible source, someone who uh, the opposing argument cannot deny, then of course you would use that quote as well. Going back to the gun control debate, if you had a quote from the president of the NRA um, and you were on the side that was opposing uh, or that was for gun control and you use that quote, that would be a good example of a quote that you could use. And then, of course, examples. These include anecdotes, um, little stories or examples from other people's lives. You can use that as well. This also it would include analogies um, as well. OK, hints for successful body paragraphs. Um, so concession, we talked about this many, many times. Again, um, you guys will probably in 20 years, if you remember nothing else from this class, you'll at least remember the principle of concession. That's when you're uh, admitting that the other side is right and valid, but then you're saying that there's a bigger, there's something bigger going on. So if your parents are talking about why did you get a B minus on this paper, you should have gotten an A, you can say, you're right, mom, you're absolutely right I should have gotten a higher grade I'm very very sorry but to be honest I was spending so much time volunteering and feeding the hungry that I just couldn't have time to study so you are essentially taking the point saying that they're right and then leveling up essentially if you want to think of it in video game terms you're leveling up to something that you consider even more important than that and then it's hard to argue against that type of technique okay um, here's an example of it. True, gun control legislation in Canada does need to be tightened to prevent the United States from becoming as violent as its neighbors to the south. The proposal that is being submitted, however, does not go far enough. This word enough is important. Instead, now the writer begins to be to build his side of the argument, showing how he is stronger, uh, how it is stronger than the opposing side. You also want to use um, transitions between sentences to serve as cues for the reader, like the words first, second, then, however, consequently, therefore, thus, still, nevertheless, notwithstanding, furthermore, in fact, in contrast, similarly, instead. So words like that can definitely help you. And I think there's a list of them on the next page um, that you have in your possession that you guys can use as well. And then the conclusion. Um, you want to restate your thesis or your focus statement. So just restate your assertion, basically. Summarize your main points. Now, here's where a lot of students get tripped up because many students will just put it in basically list form, their three main points. What you want to do is list your main points in light of what you just talked about. So for example, if you're, if you're discussing gun control, and you're saying that you're for gun control, maybe one of your examples was that um, was talking about how gun uh, um, accidental shootings amongst children is one of the reasons why um, gun control should be enforced. You just finished talking about that. You probably gave multiple examples of children who have accidentally shot either someone else or themselves um, because they were playing with guns. You want to then restate that main point in light of what you just said. So you could say something um, along the lines of, um, with, with the lives that have been taken um, because children were playing with guns, uh, gun control should be further enforced or some, something along those lines. Maybe not quite that um, emotionally driven, but something along those lines. And number three, you want to write a personal comment or a call to action. Call to action is important for uh, persuasive essays and debate because that kind of uh, gives a challenge for people at the end. Um, 
personal comment you want to be a little bit careful with and debate uh, generally speaking you want to leave yourself out of the debate as much as possible because of course the judges aren't looking for your personal uh, views on this they're only looking for how well can you um, argue the point basically so you can give a prediction which can be used to the narrative or cause and effect discussion. So the conclusion may suggest or predict what the results may or may not be in the situation discussed or in similar situations. You can give a question. This is probably my least favorite of these, but you can do it technically close to the question that lets your readers know uh, or lets your readers make their own predictions or draw their own conclusions. You can also give a recommendation. Uh, which is one that stresses the actions or remedies that should be taken. Or you can also give a quotation, and again, the same quotation rules apply um, here as do in your body paragraph or in your introduction. If you found the perfect quotation as you were doing research, absolutely feel free to include it. If you had to go searching in you know, quotes.com or something like that, then you probably shouldn't include that particular quote. All right, so as a general guideline, uh, remember these four rules. Have a firm opinion um, when you're writing your persuasive essay. Uh, begin with a grabber or a hook to get the reader's attention. You want to offer evidence to support your opinion. Conclude with a restatement of what you want the reader to do or believe, or just restating your points. Because again, you may think that no one could ever forget what you said because, of course, you know it backward and forward. So how could other people not know it backward and forward? But it, uh, people tend to forget uh, about 40% of what someone said uh, just seconds after it was said. So you want to keep that in mind that people probably forgot even your main point. I mean, let alone the evidence is underneath it. People probably forgot the main point that you uh, that you or the, I'm sorry, not the main point, but the reasons why um, you said what you said. And so you want to make sure that you just very, very briefly summarize that. All right. Um, so uh, here's a sample outline. You guys can choose what you want to do with this. This is basically the same as what I gave you earlier. Um, just this is a little bit more detailed. <clears throat> and then here's a list of transitional signals that you can use if you want to. So uh, these can be good, especially when you're speaking out loud. It can lead your audience or the judges or your opponents to another idea or a contrasting idea, perhaps. You can also conference with a peer. Now, your peer uh, would not be your opponent in this case. Don't uh, don't talk to your opponent. Uh, we want this to uh, be an actual debate. We don't want necessarily everyone to know what everyone else is saying. So next um, Thursday in class, guys, we'll go ahead and basically do this. So when you come to class next Thursday, uh, you need to at least have one of the debates done, um, and you can choose whichever one, whether you want it to be yours or the one that you're arguing the opposition for. Um, you can bring uh, it with you, and then we'll talk about it amongst others. So for example, if um, Pisha and Safia are doing an argument, um, Pisha, you can con conference with Crystal, Safia, you can conference with Luke, etc. So we can go from there. All right, but um, that's kind of the, the nugget that I said that I would hide in here is giving the homework in this case. And the homework is to begin to write and hopefully at least finish writing one of the debates so that you only have one more to do for the week after that. Um, and then we will discuss it together as a class next Thursday. So there you guys go. All right, before I let you guys go, we have about 15 minutes left. I want to go ahead and go over um, a few more argumentative rules that we have not mentioned um, up to this point. So we skipped a lot as far as um, uh, oh, as far as deductive logic and inductive reasoning. Um, and the reason is, is because that has a little bit more to do with logic than debate. But um, so we skipped a lot of the rules. So we're actually going to skip to rule 29. We skipped about six rules in the meantime. Um, and these are for extended arguments. So we're not going to spend too much time on this, but I do want to at least introduce you to some of the ideas that are mentioned here. Um, so this, it's asking you at the beginning here to suppose that you have picked or been assigned an issue or question to work on an argumentative essay or oral presentation, which of course you have been. To do this, you need to go beyond the short arguments, which we've listed so far, and you must work out a more detailed line of thought in which the main ideas are laid out clearly and their own premises in turn are spelled out and defended. 
So anything you say, remember this, this is important, I'll go ahead and highlight this. So anything you say requires evidence and reasons, which in turn may take some research, and you will need to weigh arguments for opposing views as well. All of this is hard work. And notice how they use the principle of concession here. They're conceding that it's a lot of work basically to do that, but it is also good work. For many people, in fact, it is one of the most rewarding and enjoyable kinds of thinking that there is. So think of it like um, you are proving, you are trying to find the truth. So don't think of this as just a debate, although of course it is partly just a debate, um, but you wanna think of it like you're trying to find the truth in this. So especially since you chose these debate topics for yourself, there were reasons why you chose them. For example, um, Luke, you chose uh, to talk about um, violent video games and why teenagers should be allowed to play them, I'm guessing there was some kind of a reason behind it. So you are trying to basically find proof for why you believe that. Same thing with you, Pisha. You have a personal attachment to this issue. So you are trying to find the truth behind it. And it's an exciting thing. And then if you are on the opposing side of any of those topics, you are also trying to find the truth. So maybe in the end, um, you know, Luke convinced you that his side is the best. Of course, you're still going to argue your side. Um, but Luke convinced you and then you have found the truth, basically. So you begin with an issue, but not necessarily a position. Again, this is if you're not given a position in the beginning, which, of course, um, in debate, you're always given your position. You don't get to choose for the most part. Don't feel that you must immediately embrace some position and then try to shore it up with arguments. Likewise, even if you have a position, don't just dash off the first argument that occurs to you. You are not being asked for the first opinion that occurs to you. You are being asked to arrive at a well-informed opinion that can be defended with solid arguments. So you need to have intention when you are choosing which arguments you are presenting. So it's not just like the first thing that popped into your head um, is probably uh, the best argument. In fact, a lot of times the first thing that pops in your head is not the best argument. So here's uh, here's a <clears throat> something that Carl Sagan uh, presented to people. He said, is, is life likely on other planets? Carl Sagan says that it is, but why? How could he or we argue the point? So here's one line of thought that some astronomers suggest. There are billions of stars in our galaxy alone and billions of galaxies in the universe. If even a tiny fraction of all these stars have solar systems of their own, and even a tiny fraction of those have planets suitable for life, and even a tiny fraction of those actually have life, Still, there must be a myriad of planets with life. The number of chances is still unimaginably huge. Okay. Um, oh, sorry, that was uh, skipped. Okay. Then again, why do some people have doubts? So you need to find out, basically. So if you're arguing that there is life on other planets, you need to figure out why. If you're arguing that there isn't life on other planets, you still need to figure out why. Some scientists point out that we really have no idea how common habitable planets um, might be or how likely life is to develop on them. It's all guesswork. Other critics argue that life elsewhere, or rather intelli intelligent life by now, should have announced itself, which they say hasn't happened. All these arguments carry some weight and clearly much more must be said. You already see then that unexpected facts or perspectives may well turn up as you research and develop your argument. Notice that their conclusion here, that there is intelligent life on other planets, um, is, is not easily solved by one cause. So if there is life on other planets, if that's what you're arguing, then there would be many causes that would have to go into that. If there is not life on other planets, then there will also need to be some causes that go into that. So you have to be ready to be surprised. You have to be ready to hear evidence and arguments for positions that you don't like. And you have to be ready even to let yourself be swayed. True thinking is an open-ended process. This is also important. I'll go ahead and hide this, highlight this. True thinking is an open-ended process. The whole point is that you don't know when you start where you'll find yourself in the end. So the greatest thinkers of our times are one who have an idea of of what they believe, but it's not set in stone. In other words, yes, they might go into the presupposed idea, but it's not the only idea that they're willing to accept. They have an open mind, and they have um, 
basically a mindset that they could change their opinion at any point. If they find better reasons, then they're going to believe the other side. So in a debate, of course, you are trying to argue a specific position, but have an open mind that perhaps someone else is right. You can't argue against someone who is correct. You can argue against someone who um, is correct in a wrong way, or perhaps someone who is um, uh, arguing correctly but with bad facts, but you can't argue against someone who is correct. So you want to strive to be that person, of course, the one who is correct. Because, of course, in general, um, the truth is not one side or the other. The truth is somewhere in the middle. All right. So <clears throat> I want you to go ahead, and this will probably be the last thing we get to today. Um, I want to try to um, explore the issue and try to figure out if you can um, determine uh, the, the probable cause for this and what is the truth. So, for instance, suppose you are considering the issue of global poverty. Exactly what question are you trying to answer about global poverty? Do you want to know what life is like for the global poor? Do you want to know how the current disparity between developed countries and developed countries came to be? Um, and are you trying to figure out whether people in developed countries have a moral obligation to help the global poor or whether they or we could do to help? Or are you trying to answer some other question about global poverty? Once you have a specific question in mind, try to identify potential answers to that question. So use this same principle for when you're doing your debate. So for example, if you're arguing that um, uh, st Asian students should not be restricted from attending um, Harvard or any other school that they want to, you want to ask yourself what a bunch of questions about it. So does this have to do with just Asians as a race or does this go a little bit deeper? Is this something that is only restricted to Asians or are there other races out there that are, are the same? Um, and you go back and forth basically trying to figure out um, what the question is you want answered and then answering that question even if you don't necessarily like the answer to the question. So you want to focus on the answers that are either plausible or popular. If you think there's a significant chance that some answer is correct, include it. If you know that many other people, or at least a few well-informed people, endorse a particular answer, include that one too. Even if you think that some popular answer is dead wrong, it's worth including here because you'll want to understand why people believe it. So let's go back to the election for a minute. There are a lot of people who support a candidate that you probably think is dead wrong. So you think that there's no reason why this person should be supported by anybody, whether that's, you know, any of the candidates. Everyone has a favorite and everyone has a least favorite. It doesn't matter who, who it is. Now, you want to include why people believe that thing that maybe you don't believe at all. Besides, once you see the arguments for that answer, you may find it more plausible yourself. Most people don't believe something without any reason whatsoever. Most people have a reason for believing in, in something or believing something. So you want to make sure that you actually do explore that. Don't forget to include nuanced answers. Even if the question you're considering is phrased as a yes or no question, think about answers that start with yes, but, no, but, no, unless, or a similar qualification. For instance, if you are considering whether to go to medical school, don't just list yes and no. Consider more nuanced answers, such as yes, but only if I get a good financial aid package. So again, you want to include those answers. I apologize, I think this got cut off a little bit, but I'll, I'll read it to you so you, can, so you can hear it. So should college students be required to learn a foreign language? So there's yes, no, no, except for students pursuing, pursuing certain majors, yes, but they need only learn to write, to read and write the, le the, the, excuse me, the language, not necessarily speak it. So those are the four, four of the options. Of course, there are more options than that, but it makes sense. So this response doesn't just list the simple answers of yes and no. It identifies some more nuanced possibilities. Of course, there are indefinitely uh, many other answers you could give here too. You might consider nuanced answers that begin with yes, except, or sometimes, etc. Notice that these answers do not contain reason for the answers. They simply give a direct answer to the question. And of course, um, the reasons come later. Once you have a question, you can have reasons. 
So here are a few questions um, that you could potentially um, ask yourself. So a lot of these are in the news right now, like should marijuana be legalized? Should we spend tax money to support the arts and many other needs are going unmet? Does this one sound familiar to um, the three of you who were here last week? It should because we did this debate last week. And some of you did a really good job. Actually, all of you did a really good job. Um, but the ones that I, I want to point out are the ones who said, yes, um, we should spend tax money to support the arts, even though other needs are going unmet. And you argued that it's okay to support the arts um, because supporting the arts leads to lower crime rate. It leads to all these positive things. So that's saying yes, um, but or no, but, etc. So you want to go for that. Should developers be allowed to destroy the habitats of endangered species in order to build new housing developments? So this is, again, something with no easy answer. You could say yes or no, definitely, but probably the, tr the right answer is somewhere in the middle here. So you could say, yes, they should be allowed to, but they should also find ways to protect these animals. Or no, they shouldn't be allowed to, but um, we should find more creative solutions to building elsewhere. Um, and, the, and then, of course, there's a bunch of other ones here as well that you can go over. We won't spend time on it today. Um, I want to do a little bit of exercise. Um, and uh, let's see. Okay, so we might skip some of this, actually. Okay, I do want to go over this a little bit. And again, I apologize that this is cut off a bit, um, but hopefully you'll be able to see it. So keep this in mind when you are uh, planning out your debate. So um, basically, for each of the following positions, and think of it as for your position, for each of your positions, construct one basic argument for and one basic argument against. So an argument for a particular position is just an argument that has the position itself as the conclusion of your argument. You can construct a basic argument for a position by providing some basic reasons that someone might give for supporting that position. If you're unsure about the appropriate level of detail, use examples like uh, we're about to look at. Remember that it is usually possible to find some arguments in favor of a position, even if you think the position is clearly false. Thus, by constructing arguments for a position, you are not committing yourself to thinking that the position is true. There might be more powerful arguments on the other side. This is why it's important to look at arguments both for and against the position. So you want to, when you're constructing your arguments against each position, you want to use the denial of that position as the conclusion of your argument. So the opposite, basically. Though it's not necessarily the most stylish way, you can express the denial of any claim by adding it's false that to the front of it. So if you were developing an argument against a position that judges should be forced to retire at age 70, the conclusion of your argument could be put as it is false that judges should be forced to retire at age 70. So it, that would be like the negation, basically. So real quickly, we'll go over this, and then um, that'll be all we can get to today. So for example here, and again, I apologize for the, the cutoff. Um, it's only cutting off the last couple letters, if that helps. So college students should be required to learn and read a foreign language, but not necessarily speak it. So an argument for being able to communicate with people in other countries is increasingly important for participating in ex exciting career and personal opportunities, which is a decent reason. And then, of course, you would need to have examples underneath that. Number two, most communication with people in other countries occurs in writing. Therefore, um, college students should be required to learn to read and write a foreign language, but not necessarily speak it. So um, the therefore, this is what's called a syllogism, and we sort of barely touched on this last week and the week before, um, but if you don't remember, that's basically where you have two true statements leading with a conclusion of a third statement. So that would, that the most famous syllogism of all time is, of course, um, all men are mortal, Socrates is a man, therefore, Socrates is mortal. So in order for the fault, the concluding statement to be true, these two statements have to be true as well. Um, and then against the position, number one, traveling or living in a very foreign country is a valuable mind-opening experience. Colleges should equip students to have such valuable experiences. 
To travel or live in a very foreign country, you need to be able to speak the language. Therefore, college students should be required to learn to read, write, and speak a foreign language. Therefore, it is false that college students should be required to learn to read, um, read and write a foreign language, but not necessarily speak it. And again, it is false that is not maybe the st most stylish way to refute an argument, but it is effective. Um, so for homework, you can go ahead and try to do this as a sort of exercise as well um, as to what you can do with your own argument, basically. There's a bunch of other options here. You don't need to do that. Crystal, you can take a look at these if you want to um, in order to try to choose your argument, but you don't necessarily have to choose one of these. Um, and then don't worry about the rest of the packet, guys. We'll go ahead and finish it next week. Um, but your homework is, of course, to uh, go through your debate. I'll go back uh, back to where that was. So go through your debate. Back, back, back. Okay, so you're basically going to uh, complete this outline. Obviously, you're going to have more than just one line for each of these. This is just an example. You can do this on your own piece of paper or you can type it. That's fine too. No problem at all. But do bring this next week because we will be talking about it during class and we'll be getting peer reviews and I'll take a look at it to make sure that you guys have a solid argument. So in the meantime, your job is going to be to do some research. Your job is going to be to do some reasoning um, and to just construct the best argument that you can possibly make. Um, it should be a great time and it should be uh, a lot of fun, actually. I think you guys will enjoy this um, as kind of a final hurrah for our excellent debate class. All right, if you have any questions at this point, you can go ahead and email me. Let me write my email on here in case you don't have it, although you should because I'm sending you this via email. But if you don't, um, here's my email address. You can also ask Miss Pantea a question if, if uh, you are in class right now. Um, if not, I hope you all have an excellent week, and I will see you next Thursday.